Welcome to Season 2 of the To Health With That podcast, where we break up big health topics into small bites. I'm Amy, and this season I'll share all the tips, tricks, and hacks you need to get healthy with an MTHFR mutation in a step-by-step, week-by-week process. I can't wait. This week, let's talk about high histamine, gene SNPs, and MTHFR. So histamine and MTHFR are bound together for so many reasons. One is because, just like MTHFR, histamine has its fingers in so much more than just allergies. So histamine is involved in allergic reactions, right? That's the part everybody knows about. It's also strongly involved in immune response. It opens blood vessels for vasodilation. It's a neurotransmitter, which most people don't realize, and histamine plays a big role in signaling within your stomach. Histamine levels in your body depend on two factors. One is how much is being produced, right? This depends on your gut microbiome, how easily your mast cells degranulate, which means release their histamine and kind of get activated, and allergies and the action of your basophils, which is one of your white blood cells. The second factor is how much histamine is being broken down, and this depends on MTHFR and two histamine-specific enzymes called DAO and HNMT. Histamine is mostly formed in your mast cells, which are immune cells that protect sites vulnerable to injuries, like mucous membranes in your nose and mouth, your internal body surfaces, and the insides of your blood vessels. Also in your basophils, which are a different type of white blood cell in your immune system that responds to allergens. So histamine is also scattered throughout your body tissue and has an incredibly diverse range of effects, including promoting wakefulness, otherwise known as stopping a good night's sleep or creating insomnia, constricting airways, increasing stomach acid secretion, modulating pain signals, and itch perception, as anybody with really bad seasonal allergies can tell you. Histamine is important with MTHFR for a couple of other reasons as well. Histamine breakdown is dependent on healthy methylation just like other monoamine neurotransmitters. And the HNMT enzyme, which again is one of the major breakdown pathways, needs a methyl group from SAMe in order to function. That means if your MTHFR is sluggish, then it's much harder to break down histamine and you're more likely to have a high histamine picture. Keep in mind that high histamine states are one of the characteristics of the quote-unquote under-methylation basic state. And that's a bit of a legacy term. These are the folks I like to call the achievers. Of course, more than just your MTHFR status goes into high histamine. There are several gene SNPs that can affect it, including DAO and HNMT, the two major histamine breakdown pathways. But it's still really useful for us MTHFR folks to know and understand their basic state. I believe this simply because the general patterns between over- and under-methylators, again, that's a legacy term handed down from the Walsh Research Institute, the most useful aspect is the drug and supplement reactions in each group, which I find honestly shockingly accurate. I'm going to review the gene SNPs that affect histamine. MTHFR and also other genes in the methylation pathway, especially MTAR. Also, because MTR is involved, MTRR is involved because it controls how well MTR can function. And I'll link back to that post if you're kind of having trouble following that, because it's a little difficult to say, kind of alphabet soupy. Also, remember that MTHFR is dependent on riboflavin as well, so low riboflavin status can look like difficult methylation and also high histamine. The other gene SNPs that affect histamine are, again, DAO, which is one of the major breakdown pathways, and HNMT, which is the other major breakdown pathway, and that one needs a SAMe from the methylation cycle in order to function. Most people who have high histamine know they have high histamine, but just in case you're curious, the symptoms include seasonal allergies that present as hay fever type allergies. So like the sneezing, watery eyes, runny nose, itching hives, itchy nose, sudden symptom type allergies. There are also low histamine allergies, and we'll talk about those next week. Headaches and migraines can be high histamine symptoms, shortness of breath, skin itching for no apparent reason or because of any and everything that happens, low pain tolerance, 
Digestive symptoms including cramping, diarrhea and bloating, wakefulness, insomnia, or anxiety. Also drop in blood pressure, dizziness on change of position, or even irregular heartbeat. High histamine can be seasonal, right, during an allergy season for you, or it can be constant in the case of something called histamine intolerance. Either way, there are some steps you can take towards managing high histamine levels. So step one, eat a low histamine diet, and there's entire websites devoted to low histamine diets. Some foods are extremely high in histamine, including alcohol, fermented foods, processed or smoked meats, aged cheeses, and shellfish. Avoid those and focus on very fresh, unprocessed foods. Step two, ditch the leftovers. So food that sits for a while, like leftovers, accumulates histamine while it sits. So if you generally have a high histamine picture, then leftovers might not be your friend. So make smaller portions so that you don't have food sitting around and cook fresh every time. Step three, vitamin C. Vitamin C helps to prevent mast cell degranulation. So it makes your mast cells a little bit tougher, a little bit more resistant to stimuli so that they don't release their histamine. In my own clinical experience, it's quite often a very large dose of vitamin C that actually helps, and a buffered vitamin C product like Ester C has what I've seen to be most effective. Calcium is also helpful to lower histamine levels in brain tissues and has a generally complicated relationship with histamine in mast cells, stimulating histamine release in some circumstances and then regulating it in others. For this reason, it seems like some people feel a direct and clear improvement in their symptoms with calcium supplements, and some people don't notice anything. Watch your folate levels. This is really important. So histamine increases with increasing folate, and often people with folic acid toxicity have issues with high histamine levels. Also, people who are supplementing with too much folate in any form, even the really good ones like 5-LMTHF, can have higher histamine symptoms. If you've been taking your 5-LMTHF and you notice your allergies are getting a little bit worse every season, that is probably a good sign that you're overdoing it just a little bit with the supplements. Also, another thing you can do is take the DAO enzyme. So DAO, remember, is one of your main histamine breakdown pathways, and it's available in a supplement. So it can help tremendously, especially if you experience a lot of histamine release directly related to foods that you eat. Still, a low histamine diet if possible, but supplementing DAO to help your body calm down can be very, very helpful. Also, quercetin. Quercetin is very well known and well researched to inhibit histamine production and to reduce pro-inflammatory mediators. For allergies, it should be taken in a little bit higher dose. Around 400 milligrams twice daily away from food is the most common recommendation that I've seen and the one that I've had the most clinical success with. Thank you so much for listening today. And it's official. A free MTHFR Basics course has launched at courses.tohealthwiththat.com. I am pretty sure all the glitches have been ironed out, and that's happy news. So there is also an in-depth MTHFR for Life course coming this summer. That one will need beta testers who will be able to attend the course for a quarter of the usual price. So definitely sign up for the mailing list at tohealthwiththat.com or on the course page so you're the first to know so you get a shot at that beta testing price. Thank you.